and minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Mayor Pete, this is episode 200 for us. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Right. And thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, we, we want to set politics aside today because ours isn't really a political podcast. We wanted to talk to you about values, about contribution, about leadership, about your minimalist uniform. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot to talk about today, so we're going to uh, dive into it. We're, we're here with uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. He is a 2020 candidate for, well, for president. That's right. Yeah. It's quite the, uh, quite the leap from, from mayor, and we're going to talk about how we can, we can talk about transitioning from, from executive experience as mayor into, well, potentially becoming president. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to start off by saying, Ryan and I, uh, we, we have radically different political beliefs, spiritual beliefs. And that's what makes this podcast so great. So we're not here to endorse a particular candidate, but I really like what Pete has put together with his book, with his message. And I thought a lot of the things you talk about, they really align with what we talk about. Mm. And I thought maybe it would make sense to, to start by talking about what does it mean to live a meaningful life? Mm. So for me, I think it has to do with making yourself useful. I think you just have a richer sense of being alive if you know that uh, it matters in somebody else's day that that you're there or, or that it's you, not somebody else, doing the particular thing that you're doing. And that can take a lot of different forms. But for me, obviously, it's, it's mainly taken the form of service, uh, public service and military service. And the opportunity to do that in the context of something that you care about, uh, I think certainly fills me with meaning. It's got some hazards to it. Uh, Let's talk about some of those hazards. Well, one of the hazards in politics is that uh, when you're in office, you have a very meaningful job. I mean, you can't miss the fact that what you do matters because people are coming up to you all the time with often the most important thing going on in their lives and asking you to help. Mm -hmm. The problem with it, it's a very fulfilling thing. The problem with it is it means that uh, because your work is meaningful, there is a risk that you will uh, rely on your work in order to make your life meaningful. And Mm -hmm. if you don't have meaning without your job, that means you need your job a lot. And part of being good in public office is knowing that that there are some things that are worth more than your job. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's part of what makes you good at it, is is if there are some things that that you would be willing to lose your job over, you know, doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've seen the, the, the risk or the hazard of becoming dependent literally for meaning on having a certain title or a certain office. And, uh, and yet, um, who can pass up the, the chance to, to do that kind of meaningful work whenever you're, uh, whenever you're invited to do it or feel like you have a chance to do it? Well, how do you reconcile that then? Because having meaningful work isn't necessarily the same thing as having a meaningful life. I think mm-hmm. you can derive a significant amount of, of meaning from, from what you're doing, but then there's, of course, your values and, and your life outside mm-hmm. of work. And I thought it'd be appropriate to sort of talk about some of those values. You, mm-hmm. on, your, on your website, you put together a, a list of, of your values. You called it the rules of the road. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I thought maybe we could talk about a few of those. Which, one, which, which, of, which of these stand out to you? I mean, obviously, they're, they're all important to you. But Ryan and I are often talking about our values, uh, core values, foundational mm-hmm. values. Yeah. Let's talk about some of your values. Sure. So uh, we have a set, uh, we, yeah, we call them the rules of the road because I want to make sure anybody who's part of this campaign, whether it's a, a volunteer or a supporter or a staff member or myself, that I'm held to this too, that, that we're working in a way that's consistent. And uh, the the very first one on the list is is respect, because it's really important, especially given the kind of environment, as we all know, that surrounds politics and the coverage of politics, that we uh, show a certain level of respect for the office, for each other, for the the people that we're seeking to serve, for our competitors, Mm -hmm. even. And it uh, helps us model what I'm trying to do as president before the first vote is ever cast. Another very important value for us is belonging. So I, I think we actually have a, uh, an emergency, a crisis of belonging in this country. And uh, I think our current political environment's making it worse. And mm-hmm. what we need to do right now is build up a greater sense of belonging, uh, knowing that this is also something that, that feeds directly into health. Uh, that, you know, I think the reason we're seeing a lot of uh, what are called deaths from despair now, lives lost to, uh, to drugs, to, to alcohol, to suicide, often have to do with people self-medicating for issues that are connected to that uh, that struggle for belonging that that yeah. so many people feel uh, and so 
the other side of the coin is we have a shot at in this campaign of building out a sense of belonging just by letting people know that they fit into our vision for the country and trying to, to reflect that in, in even our events when, when, when we're out doing things. Um, we, uh, we think a lot about uh, responsibility and just the idea of, of the responsibility that obviously uh, goes with public office, but therefore that all of us involved in a project to win public office in a mm-hmm. campaign mm-hmm. Uh, ought to embrace and, and uh, owning what we're working on. I was, um, I was really heartened by, by your ownership in, in one of the debates when you said, I didn't get it done. Mm-hmm. And and you, I could tell it was heartfelt, but I, I, I could also tell like you, you were willing to take uh, radical ownership of something because guess what? There are all, all of us can recognize that we don't get stuff done sometimes. Even mm-hmm. though we've tried, yeah. uh, we can't accomplish everything that we try. And, and I think you know, failure is obviously, is obviously a part of it. Yeah. Um, and, and so taking responsibility to me you know, from someone who is, is a politician who is in public service, uh, as opposed to just passing the buck, that's uh, I think that's something that that is significant, and unfortunately not something we see enough of. Yeah. Well, I think it's definitely the instinct of a mayor because you're you're on the ground, you're you're in this world where there there's a lot of accountability for for what has gone well and what hasn't. You don't come in promising that everything will be fixed, and and uh, and so when something doesn't get all go the distance, I need to acknowledge that because we all as a city need to think about uh, what we would do differently. Um, but there's you know there's no alternative facts when you're a mayor. Like, people can see whether something went well. Something as simple as snow plowing or something as as deep and intractable as as uh, uh, neighborhood equality and uh, and economic development. So you got to own it. Things go well, you get the credit. Things go poorly, you got to own up to what happened and what you could have done better. Yeah, that's one thing I really appreciate appreciate about you is that you do take ownership. But I think it's too often we look for like this perfect candidate. We look for this you know perfect person to be president. And none of us are perfect. Right. So it's like for me, I don't want a I don't want a perfect president. I just want someone who can take ownership and who can be self reflective and learn and move forward. Speaking of learning, um, your book, uh, which, by the way, um, I have this theory that all political memoirs are vapid, trite, and empty, <laughs> um, and you totally shattered that. Uh, oh, thank you. From uh, you, you write gorgeously, so so Thanks. bravo for that. Um, and I think you've you, you put together a book that was, in many ways, was written. Uh, the prose was written like a novel, I felt like, a lot of the time. It opened up with like just a gorgeous scene of South Bend and uh, some of the narrative sort of overlay of uh, the, the scene where you're running through South Bend and sort of describing the city. I thought that was a, that, that was a, a, a beautiful narrative device to sort of move things through and give people who have never been to the Midwest or to, to South Bend a, a sort of tour of the city, the, the good and bad side of things. Uh, you talked a moment ago about a, a crisis of belonging and also a crisis of meaning. And Ryan and I are from Dayton, Ohio. Mm. A few years ago, it was the overdose capital of America. Um, a, lot, uh, a lot going on there because a lot of, uh, you're familiar with this with South Bend, a lot of the jobs left um, with the manufacturing and that closed a whole bunch of plants and people found tremendous meaning in their work, but then they also felt, I mean, I think especially today, we, do, we feel like we don't belong as much. I, I saw a, I saw a, um, a survey of millennials that, uh, that said, I think it was 23% of millennials don't even have an acquaintance. Wow. And if you think, if you if you're thinking about belonging, you don't even have an acquaintance. You're yeah. so far from a sense of community. Yeah. But it seems to me that you've identified a, a uh, you, you've been able to establish or help reestablish a sense of community. Can we talk about some of the lessons that you've learned being the mayor of South Bend? Some of the ones you wrote about in your book. Yeah, part part of what I share in the book and why why it's called the shortest way home is that uh, there's a saying: the longest way around is the shortest way home, and and uh, it. Uh, took me a while to figure out how much belonging and meaning was going to come from my community, the, the place that I'd grown up in, the place I couldn't wait to get out of mm-hmm. when I was 18. And I think a lot of people who grow up, especially in smaller communities or, or in the industrial Midwest, uh, kind of take on board that message that success means getting out. Yeah. And uh, Why I, is that? You know, I think part of it's because the trajectory has been so tough in these cities. And uh, and part of it is, I think, the allure of, of the, the, the global, of the big city. And I'm a, I, I love big cities. I, lo- I, love, I love the world. But um, there was something that I didn't know I needed waiting at home. 
And part of it had to do with that idea I shared earlier about making yourself useful. The fact that I could, uh, I could meaningfully do things in my community that, that would really have an impact on a lot of people and um, that I had something to offer, both because I was from the community and because I was in a kind of tension with it. Uh, you know, you, you, if you're exactly like all of the people you serve, then you probably don't have that much to offer them. You're just a mirror, mm. right? Um, but if, if you have a little bit of tension, I grew up not sure I belonged and, and, and had questions and, 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 and problems with, with uh, my city, even, even as I began to realize once I left that I also loved the place. And so realizing what was kind of waiting for me all along w- w- is, I think, um, the, the story of, 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 of that part of my life, and, it, and it's also the, the story of the book. Um, I learned a lot of lessons about uh, just what it means to uh, see through the eyes of others. Uh, a big part of what happens when you're a mayor is you uh, you kind of channel all of the uh, uh, the hopes and the fears and the frustrations of others, and then you got to weigh that against your own self, your own understanding of, of of what matters in the world. And when people who are radically different from you, who might live a mile or two away from you, are in your face saying, you know, this isn't working for my neighborhood, or you're you know, the city's not taking care of me or I, I want this to be different. It puts a big pressure on you. It tears you up a little bit, actually. But but then it also helps you grow because you extend yourself to all these these other people. And you we, you see a lot of um, a lot of cities have found a different future. Dayton's a, an example of a city, actually, with, with a great mayor. Um, in fact, we uh, we voted her in to, to be the president, uh, or she's a vice president now, to eventually become the uh, president of the conference of mayors because so many other mayors are interested in what's going on there. Mm-hmm. I think precisely because of the challenge. Uh, I think if cities like ours were uh, prosperous, homogenous, uh, uh, growing cities with no real problems, it'd be kind of boring. I don't think there'd be much purpose yeah. <laughs> for somebody like me at least in, in, in serving um, but uh, because we know the magnitude of the challenge in front of a city like mine that was characterized as dying in the media uh, mm-hmm. the, the same uh, month that I got in the race for mayor and is now you know by no means has overcome all of our problems but is on just a different trajectory of growing and, and stands up taller and believes in itself um, there's so much meaning in that mm. Ryan and I, you know, we we are the minimalists. We we've we've been the minimalists for about a decade now. Uh, people know us most from a Netflix documentary that we did, and when we talk about minimalism. It often starts with the sort of stuff, and we're talking about uh, America's and the Western world's. Uh, uh, obsession with overconsumption. The average American household has 300,000 items in it. And that'd be fine if those things were going to make us happy. But I think what we've we've often learned is like we're, we're consuming to sort of pacify ourselves, yeah. to, to fill a void that can never be filled with stuff. And so when we talk about minimalism, we're often talking about removing the excess stuff in our lives so we can actually focus on what's important, making room for what's truly important. We're not monks. We're not ascetics. We're not trying to tell people and proselytize. You need to get rid of all of your stuff. Um, What we're trying to do is help people realize that many of the things we thought we needed, we probably don't need them as much as we think. And there are some things that can augment our experience of life and enhance our experience of life. But uh, we talk about minimalism, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about getting the the sort of excess out of the way. And some people often ask us, like, could there ever be a minimalist president? (laughs) Oh, interesting. (laughs) And I... I, I don't know the answer to that. I think the closest we've ever had is is, is someone uh, like Calvin Coolidge. Hmm. And I have some, some quotes from him that really stand out to me. And I thought maybe we could talk about uh, about a few of these because, honestly, they, they reminded me of things like if you were to say, well, Pete Buttigieg said this, I'd be like, ah, that's not, I'm not surprised by this. <laughs> um, on contribution, Coolidge said, no person has ever honored has ever honored for what he has ever been honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave, mm. and um, I, I I think that I think that um, we, when you you talk about contribution, uh, and and I mean I think we could talk about honor as well. But um, what do you think? What do you think about a, a quote like that? I think it makes a lot of sense, and it, and it shows you how fulfillment doesn't come from how much we accumulate, right? Uh, but from rather kind of what we put into the world, what we put out there. Um, I mean, the idea of honor is itself an interesting and sometimes mischievous concept, right? Because we, we may go after it in ways that um, put too much stock in, in what others think of us. Um, but I think there is something meaningful about the fact that those we look up to most are not the ones who have 
accumulated the most or surrounded themselves with the most, but rather have put forward the most or, or, or offered a lot. Um, and I think that's not a bad vision to take into the presidency, right? It's not about, um, it's not the kind of office you should seek because you think you'd like to have it. Right. it it's, it's a way to get things done. Mm-hmm. And it's a way to get things done to help and serve others who uh, place that office in your hands, trusting that you'll do something good with it. And I, I remember feeling that with even the, the position of mayor, not just the policy uh, responsibilities and powers that came with it, but little things. The fact that just showing up at somebody's event or giving a plaque to a kid who did well in school or something, you're basically taking this, this thing that's been placed in your hands and then using it to uh, make other people feel good or important. Uh, and and that's, that's big. The symbolic stuff, I talk about this in the book as well. Um, I hated the symbolic kind of parts of the mayor's job when yeah. I first came in. I thought it was... I was annoyed uh, by it at first too because like, I, I think I was very similar to you where it was like, uh, I'd rather be focused on policy and yes. we've got to fill the potholes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there, there's a whole other half that is right. equally important to, to the citizens of, of your city. That's right. And I gradually discovered that, that the things that are not the documented functions of the job, consoling somebody who is grieving, congratulating somebody who achieves something, mm-hmm. showing up at an event when you have no substantive role just in order to let the organizers of the event know that whatever it is they're working on is important to you and therefore important to the city. That's actually real. That, that's a yeah. real contribution. And with the presidency too i think that some of the most important parts of the presidency are not documented they're the parts that have to do with calling people to their highest values setting a tone what you do and what you don't do and you know in the spirit of minimalism the the thing i often think about with with uh coolidge now that you mention him because honestly i don't think about coolidge that much but (laughs) um this idea of not a fan of the 20s (laughs) (laughs) but this idea of economy of words even matters Mm -hmm. right it's something i strive for to try to make sure that every word that i utter that there's a pretty good ratio of meaning to uh uh air taken up (laughs) yeah Yeah. i i feel like i feel like you speak in prose which is uh is refreshing considering other people uh, on spending, Coolidge says, there is no dignity quite so impressive and no independence quite so important as living within your means. Mm. <sighs> Ryan, I know we were going to talk about um, the country sort of living within their means. We have a question mm. about it. Our, our podcast is usually very audience driven, so we've got some questions coming in here. But let's talk a, a moment about uh, personally, like living with, within our means. Um, you... You famously talk about how you have student debt, yeah. uh, and um, I think that's that's one thing that is is plaguing our country, not just student debt, but consumer debt in right. general. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of that, a big part of that, has to do with us living beyond our means. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that uh, in terms of personal responsibility, and then maybe we can expand it to the the country as well, living beyond its means. Yeah. So I think the important thing is to look at what debt is supposed to do for us, right? And there's actually an entire, there's a history, I can't remember the name of the author, but a, a, a brilliant book's been written that just goes all the way back to the invention of debt. I think if I remember the book right, he suggests that the concept of debt was invented before the concept of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that we, it was Jeffrey we, Miller. We, uh, maybe, or Graber, could that be right? Anyway, somebody can look it up as we speak. <laughs> and um, uh, it, it's very important. It's an important part of how we finance uh, public projects, how we smooth in our lives, right? If, if you're trying to um, be able to make an investment in your education, you're supposed to be able to borrow against the earnings that you're going to earn in the future because you got the education, plow those into your own growth, and by it, everybody comes out better. The problems emerge when expectations are misaligned or we take on more than we can handle, mm-hmm. um, or in some cases, and, and this is something that worries me a lot from a policy perspective, uh, you know, some of the student debt was run up uh, at institutions that were exploited and never really going to deliver that much value to their students. And uh, unfortunately, the enforcement of that has been uh, degraded, but it's one of the things I hope to restore. As a country, I think this is important from a generational perspective. So it's been less fashionable in my party, the Democratic Party, to talk about debt and deficit, Mm. uh, largely because I think we we resist those who use it as an excuse not to make investments. But Mm. there's a real problem here. I mean, there are some fiscal time bombs that are going to go off in my lifetime. And we need to look at what it means to uh, tell people that we can just continue cutting taxes and you'll pay less and less, Mm -hmm. Um, but we'll continue maintaining these expectations of services. Mm -hmm. And uh, sooner or later, one or the other has to give. Either our 
um, public life will be degraded and we'll just make do with having inferior roads and diminished health and uh, um, uh, and inferior uh, kind of national achievement. Sounds like the American um, dream. Yeah. Yeah. Or we'll have giant deficits. Right now we got both. Both of those things have happened. Yeah. Um, but we can set the right balance between what we contribute into public things and what we expect from them. And it's part of what my presidency will seek to do, to just have a level of balance there. Yep. Um, that is tough. It's not always rewarded politically, but it's needed from the standpoint of prudence in order to set up the country for success. Yeah. You, when Josh and I, when we talk about consumer debt or personal debt, our, we have a philosophy. Uh, it's, I don't know if you've heard of Dave Ramsey, but his philosophy mm-hmm. is there's no such thing as good debt. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that with my personal side, so I just became debt free for the first time in my life uh, back in 2016. And for me, like that is, um, I haven't felt freer th- than that. Um, it's like if, you know, everything hit the fan, I could uh, move apartments because, you know, I wouldn't be able to afford LA rent, but uh, I, I wouldn't have any debt collectors chasing me. I would, you know, p- could pretty much turn my life around on a dime. So consumer, that makes sense to me. But as, as a nation to say there's no such thing as good debt, that doesn't sound right to me. But I know $22 trillion also doesn't <laughs> sound right to me. Yeah. So I guess, is there a balance where where we do need to take on some debt and like where is that balance do you yeah so the the <clears throat> the simplest way to put it is there are th- there are things that pay for themselves and there are things that don't mm. and uh we really need to pay attention to the difference uh so for example there was a theory that was popular for a while that certain kinds of tax cuts would pay for themselves uh we tried it and it turns out that's not true um, but it's also very clear that certain investments in things like pre-kindergarten education or uh, uh, criminal justice reform or infrastructure do pay for themselves. In that case, it mm. would be irresponsible not to, right? Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, it's the simple, and people may find it's better not to bother, but also in personal finance, right? If, if, you, if I have a mortgage at 3% and I can save uh, at 5% and get interest on that, then I am uh, sacrificing money by not maintaining a certain level of debt. Because right. if I paid off the mortgage, I'd have that much less money to save. So, you know, this right. is this is a personal calculation people can make for themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you, also, but, you have to weigh other costs. Like there are psychological costs sure. of having that debt and, and, yeah. and, and other costs that are sort of non-monetary. I mean, yeah. it, it's the same cost like when we, we think about bringing a new item into our lives. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, there's the price tag, right? Mm-hmm. But the true cost goes way beyond the price mm-hmm. tag. It's the price of storing the thing and cleaning the thing and yeah. changing the batteries in the thing right. or putting oil in the thing. Like, yeah. there are all these additional costs and and I think you're right it's, it's very much a personal calculus mm-hmm. but when we look at, at the, uh, the the country writ large we, we have we have a tremendous amount of, of spending mm-hmm. uh, we have a tre- tremendous amount of debt and in fact I think we have a question from from Tim do you want to play that question podcast Sean living below your means is a core doctrine of minimalism as president, what steps would you take to decrease the current national debt of more than twenty-two trillion dollars? So, Mayor Pete, I, I think that you know Tim's asking for some like uh, s- some specificity here. Like, what what do we do to decrease? Like, is there an appropriate amount of debt? It sounds to me like it's probably not twenty-two trillion yeah, dollars, right? Somewhere between yeah. zero and twenty-two trillion, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a share of our economy, it should be lower than it is. Um, but again, uh, it would also be foolish to have zero because you're then uh, denying yourself opportunities yep. at a national level right. that can only be financed with the right level of debt. So how do we get it right? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, I mean, basically, we need to uh, only take on things that we can afford, and then we need to be willing to raise the revenue to do it. Mm-hmm. I would think of it this way. Most developed countries, about a third of their economy flows through the public in some way. If you add up state, local, everything from you know what goes into schools and libraries to nationally collected taxes that you might spend on the military or national effort, it's about a third. Mm-hmm. Mm. For us, it's a quarter. Mm. And in that difference between a quarter and a third lies, in my view, the inferiority of our public infrastructure, our transportation resources, our health, and a lot of other things relative to uh, most of those developed countries. Now, the real problem is that we've maintained expectations of having a high level of infrastructure and uh, health and and housing but we've cut the amount we're paying into it down so Mm. it's got to come out of somewhere and right now where it's coming out of is that the debt is growing Mm. um i would argue that spending is actually uh it's not because of spending it's because the relationship between spending and what we're bringing in um but it is also abundantly clear that there is more than enough in this 
in the abundance of this country to finance all the expectations we do have. Maybe not if we go all the way. It's one of the reasons compared to my uh, some of my competitors, I'm not promising you know free everything that, that, that we can just pay down the last penny of tuition even for the wealthiest person to go to college. Right. Um, but I do think we need to do more than we are now. I mean, we should have better travel. I, I'm not even asking for Japanese level trains. I just like maybe Italian level. That'd be nice compared to what we got now. <laughs> right. um, and that would if history is any guide, unlock a lot of economic potential. Yeah. Um, but you also have to be willing to pay for it. So, you know, do we want to continue to live in a world where, uh, you know, a company like Amazon can make billions of dollars in profits and pay exactly zero in federal taxes, mm. in which case we'll continue to be unable to pay for our national priorities, or we can do something about that. Um, do we want to continue to live in a world where uh, the wealthiest among us uh, proportionally generally pay less in taxes than the people mopping their floors? Or are we going to adjust that? Mm-hmm. It's a policy question. Yeah. And in some ways, it's also a question of power because uh, um, the, the, the wealthiest people usually are more likely to be the, in the ears of politicians than the people who mop floors. Yeah. Um, so it's not an accident that, that, that these things come about. Mm-hmm. But we sometimes we talk about like it's just impossibly out of reach to deliver uh, a, a decent standard of living and, and good public things, good schools, good, good roads. Uh, and so forth. And the truth is, it's just a matter of what we're willing to pay for. Yeah. You, br- you bring up college. And when I think about college debt, I mean, it can be, it can be so crippling. I mean, I know it's, it's crazy to me that at 18 years old, you can start to take on six figures worth of debt, but you can't go and buy a beer. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I am not one for regulation. Like I think, you know, we do need it sometimes, but when I look at colleges charging so much, mm-hmm. it's almost like, there has to be, there's got to be some give somewhere yeah. where, uh, I guess what I'm asking is, is like, do you think that that would be like a wise move? Like to, to regulate, like what colleges could charge and couldn't charge versus, you know, what their students are earning after they graduate. Is there an answer, I guess, to the, to the college debt situation? Well, one way you could come at it is, and, and we have a, a set of initiatives I would undertake on reducing college cost and giving you a way to uh, to reduce your debt afterwards. But but from a kind of philosophical level, mm. part of what we could do um, is just examine the ratio of how much of the cost is being uh, placed onto the student versus uh, an investment. For example, states that invest in good public colleges tend to come out ahead. Mm. And that's a collective investment paid for even by people who won't go to college. Um, but they're paying something into having a robust state university system because that'll boost the economy. Mm. But the idea of paying for it completely means you're asking people who won't go to college, who as a general rule make less, right. to pay for everybody who does, who as a general rule will make more. Right. And I do think that's philosophically problematic. I would agree. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm a little allergic to the idea that we're just going to kind of blow away all cost. Right. Um, but you're right. There's also a question about, okay, how much are we heaping on here? And, and how much of this, I mean, the minimalism framework might be an interesting one here. If you think about the, the um, accoutrements of a university, right, mm-hmm. how much of it is part of what is needed in order to have a university function well, right. to, to grow knowledge and inquiry and create the spaces in which ideas, even even uh, risky ideas, can be kicked around and tested and people can commit themselves full time to learning as much as you possibly can about yourself and the world around them. Yeah. And how much is it just stuff? <laughs> yeah. It, it <laughs> seems that, that tuition costs have, have gone up in, in proportion to... Um, the bloating of sort of the administrative complex mm-hmm. within yeah it's almost the function of bureaucracy is to create more bureau- bureaucracy in a way i had this uh, this new yorker cartoon right here and it's a guy at the doctor's office and he said has your address uh, the the woman on the other side of the counter says has your address insurance or family relationship changed since you started filling out these forms <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I feel that way with with any of these large bureaucratic institutions it, where there is there's a need for some bureaucracy there, there's a need for some some organization mm-hmm. but as it continues to expand it doesn't mean we're getting more professors we're getting more ideas in there we're, we're getting more layers of, of administration and when the costs go up what Ryan was talking about a moment ago the they sort of the, the problem is that it almost becomes predatory lending at some point. Yeah. The 18 year old who does get into six figures worth of debt, it's two steps removed from the corner store loan that, that charged you 3,400% interest. Yeah. Well, and one thing that's going on that, that doesn't get as much attention is for every you know middle or upper, upper middle 
class student who's got a uh, six figure debt and it's a, it's a real weight, but they will eventually get through it. Mm-hmm. There is a low income student who has maybe five figure debt mm. um, that is going to prevent them from ever being able to get out because they're so low income on the way in. And you know some of these colleges, especially these for profit colleges that uh, uh, that can really take advantage of people if there's no quality control, uh, have uh, as you said, I mean they basically turned the Department of Education into a predatory lender. Mm. And there needs, in my view, there needs to be a much higher level of accountability around that. Uh, the question of bureaucracy, it will always be with us. You know, when I was in the military, I basically participated in the largest and most bureaucratic bureaucracy in America, right, which is the uh, the Department of Defense. And there are some things that it does uh, incredibly well, uh, and uh, better than anybody in the world. And then there's sometimes you're in what uh, one officer I knew called a self-licking ice cream cone, where it just nobody knows why they're doing what they're doing, but everybody's doing it a mm. lot in triplicate, and mm. it just takes on a life of its own. And as mayor, I've always tried to, to kind of declutter our own smaller bureaucracy that I oversee in city government to make sure that any process that exists exists for a reason, and that if there's any place where we're doing something in step, seven steps, and it could be four, mm. that we root that out and find it. And, and make sure that we're coming back to our actual mission. Speaking of being the governor of a, of a city in the industrial Midwest, yeah, we're, we're three 37-year-old guys. Well, I just turned 38 from the industrial Midwest. And, um, Great vintage. <laughs> <laughs> right. What do, you think, what do you think the rest of the country can learn from the industrial Midwest? From, mm. from um, I don't know, maybe we're, we're at as a badge of honor now, but I always thought of it as a pejorative when people called it the Rust Belt. Um, yeah, I know your, your mayor in Dayton hates the term. I, I think we might lean into it a little bit. Let's just own it. Yeah. You know? uh, There's beauty in the rust. Yeah. yeah. So the funny thing now, I think especially since 2016, is the, the Rust Belt, at least politically, became fashionable, right? People were ignoring us for a long time, and s- now they're like studying us with like ex- exotic fascination. Like <laughs> reporters rock up; they're like, "Take me to your dive bar. I want to. I want to understand the you know the political soul of the of the Rust Belt." Um, and uh, I think really the, the big thing is, is to learn about change and, and to examine how we can cope with change in ways that make us better off. I mean, uh, by one reckoning, the, some of the best things that ever happened were the technological developments of the last 50 years. And yet the impact on communities like where you and I grew up uh, has been devastating. Mm. And so then it forces us to ask, okay, how do we face these changes and make sure that they actually work in a way that benefits all of us or more of us instead of entire communities moving in the opposite direction of the rest of the country economically. And and yet the other thing you see in, in a lot of these communities is tremendous amount of creativity because it took so much more uh, innovation and ingenuity and grit just to literally stay open, maybe, in a place where the economy was collapsing around you mm. than it takes to make a buck in the middle of a, of a gold rush right, somewhere. Yeah. Um, that you also see this, this level of, uh, I mean, what people have cobbled together in areas where they don't have a lot to work with um, is amazing. And also this, what I'm very proud to see is this kind of militant identity emerging in the Rust Belt um, that we take some pride in it, we own it. And again, I think it's because it's just plain more interesting to participate in the resurrection of a place that was left for dead mm. than it is to be part of a, uh, uh, a place that's, that's just kind of humming along and doesn't have a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah, one thing we're, we're trying to do right now is we're uh, the west side of Dayton. Uh, uh, about forty percent of the population lives there, uh, but it's one of the largest food deserts in the country. Mm-hmm. There's not a single grocery store on the west side, and uh, so we've partnered up with a, a place called Jim City Market, and we've encouraged our audience that people who have never even been to Dayton, Ohio, and they know about Dayton, Ohio because the minimalists talk about it That's every great. other <laughs> podcast, but to try to to shine a light o- on it and. Uh, We've had we've had people who visit. Yeah, you know, they'll send us tweets all the time. What you know? What dive bar do I go to yeah. as I'm driving through? You know, my way to Indianapolis or wherever. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that sense of place, it, mm. the the sort of there's almost a creative constraint there that because it, it is not a boom town, and you have you know just a few scraps to work with. Um, there, there's a sense of pride, but also there's a, a creativity that emerges from that that mm. I think. Uh, doesn't emerge if you don't have that sort of that pressure to, to create yeah. the diamonds. That's true. 
Yeah. Uh, in South Bend, I'm sure you've seen that as well. A lot has changed. A lot of the the factories are no longer factories now. They're they're sort of uh, tech startups, and and uh, uh, they, they've changed appreciably from the 1962. Uh, what was it, Studebaker? That's right. Yeah, yeah uh, the, the sort of collapse there. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we were a company town for Studebaker, uh, and I grew up not even realizing it was unusual to have collapsing factories and empty houses around because mm. that was just the story of our city. We lost 30,000 people when they closed in mm. the 60s. Uh, <clears throat> it was only after I left and came back that I realized how stark that was. Um, but, you know, my campaign announcement happened in a, an 800,000-square-foot Studebaker factory that I think is only still there because it was too big to blow up and nobody was sure, quite sure what to do with it. And now we're in a partnership to uh, make it into, largely take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of fiber optic cable running along the same railway right away that serve the factories that can now be used to help us with the data center economy. So, um, you know, there's ups and downs and it's tricky to make it all work, but there's growth now happening on the very acreage where we were making cars, creating jobs in these industries didn't exist when we were making cars. Mm. And it's another example of how, in a way, we're doing what we always did, which is taking what's around us, fashioning value out of it, and doing something innovative and new. Because you could argue that the auto industry in the 20s is, is very much like the, the tech industry uh, of the early 2000s. But also fashioning that, that future in a way that responds to our tradition. And there's a, there's a beauty in it. Um, there, there's a, a, a joy in it. Um, and we're, we're proud of what we've been able to do precisely because of how much we were on the ropes for mm. such a long time. And uh, everybody should, on your way to Dayton, swing by South Bend and uh, enjoy the, the life of our city. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Ryan, we got some lightning round questions. Let's, uh, let's dive into some of those. We do. Uh, this is where we answer some questions from social media. So uh, this is from Tiny. How difficult would it be to get rid of the Electoral College? If we want to be a true democracy and not a republic, shouldn't the popular vote be what gets counted? Totally agree. Every other election we run in this country, you give it to the person who got the most votes. Yeah. And generally, when a democracy is picking its president, I think it's appropriate to, to give it to the person who got the most votes. How difficult would it be? Very difficult, but I think we should do it. Now, there's an interstate <coughs> compact that's going around where states, more and more states are pledging that uh, they would, if enough states sign on, then they will give their electoral college votes to whoever wins the popular vote. So that's a way to do it without having to change the Constitution. Mm. But I actually believe a change like this deserves a constitutional amendment. And it might take 10 or 20 years to get it done. All the more reason, I believe, to start talking about it now. Yeah. Uh, because right now what's happening is uh, it's not even helping systematically helping small states. It's just helping certain states. Mm. So your vote in California, my vote in Indiana, don't matter because California is too collectively too liberal and mm. Indiana's collectively too conservative, but it also drowns out the votes of liberals in Indiana and conservatives in California. Mm. Um, there's a fear that rural areas might be disadvantaged, but the reality is, you know, when you're running for governor, which is a race that we run in the traditional way, you know, mm -hmm. person who gets the most votes wins, people still go to rural areas because you're trying to speak to all the different kinds of voters that you serve. Yeah. I think the same is true nationally. And so we would just be a little, a, a little more worthy of the name of democracy if we got it done. Yeah. Now, w uh, to play devil's advocate there, wouldn't, wouldn't you have, uh, I mean, uh, wouldn't someone argue that we're not in a democracy, though? We, we are, are part of a republic. Uh, yeah, to me, that's, that's kind of an academic distinction. I mean, of course, we're not a direct democracy where you vote on your iPhone on every bond issue that, that the government does. But uh, democracy to me is a value. Mm -hmm. And what matters is how democratic is our democratic republic. And I would argue it's not democratic enough. Mm -hmm. There may be such a thing as too much democracy. I think California sometimes uh, does its best to explore just how far you can go in the direction of democracy. But <laughs> when it comes to decisions like how we pick our president or whether our Congress is set up according to districts that even remotely reflect uh, kind of a balanced uh, a version of the American people. Yeah, the um, gerrymandering maps are brutal. just unbelievable. It's brutal. And I don't think there's any principled defense of how that works. So I guess what I'm saying is let's make our democratic republic more democratic. Yeah, totally agree. All right, the next question we got is from Vanessa. How important is the idea of freedom to you? And how would you incorporate this into how you lead the country? Mm. So the idea of freedom is central to my campaign. It'll be central to my presidency. Uh, the thing I'm doing that's a little different is that uh, part of my, my campaign is about recognizing that government is not the only thing that can make you unfree. Mm. And so we're trying to look at freedom as the freedom to live a life of your choosing. Sometimes that means government getting out of the way. Uh, I believe that's the case on something like the, a woman's right to choose mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> or the right of somebody like me to choose my own spouse without uh, being told by a county clerk based on her idea of her religion who I ought to marry. Mm -hmm. 
Part of it, though, requires the government to step up to make sure that we have a system for healthcare where everybody can get healthcare. Because then I'm more free to go start a small business or a podcast or whatever because I know I'll have coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it is the, the freedom that, that can only come to us if we have good education which means we, we have to invest in education. So uh, f- delivering freedom is not as easy as eliminating uh, the state. Otherwise, the mm. freest country in the world would probably be Somalia. Mm. Um, but uh, it does mean that we have to transcend this argument over how big or how small the government's going to be mm-hmm. and ask at every turn, is this measure going to make us more free or less free? Yeah. I think we also have to identify what is freedom. And sometimes we think about freedom as, as doing whatever you want whenever you want, but... <laughs> My six-year-old daughter, if I let her do whatever she <laughs> wants, whenever she wants, that uh, she would go out and play in the street. You know, it, it, she, it's tyranny in a way if, if you're doing whatever you want, whenever you want. I think real, real freedom also involves uh, a sort, certain amount of self-restraint and, mm-hmm. and, and, and discipline. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, we're just bouncing around like a, a pinball. That's right. You can think of it as, uh, for example, an alarm clock. An alarm clock is a contract between your higher order self and your lizard brain because your lizard brain just wants to sleep because you're tired. But your higher order self has decided that, that, that you have a, an appointment at a certain time in the morning and you need to make it. And so you set the alarm clock. It's like an agreement between your night self and your morning self. Mm-hmm. And government can be like that too. There's a, a law school whose motto includes talking about the, those wise constraints that make us free. And uh, we always have to think about freedom in a richer sense because yeah, there's a lot more to it than just running around doing whatever we feel like. Can you talk about the role of faith in, in your life? Because um, I know we often hear politicians talk about it, but it tends to be politicians on the other side of the aisle. And we, we have a lot of people of faith in, in our audience. We also have a lot of atheists. And um, I would like to talk to you about how it's played a role in your life. So it's very important to me personally. Um, officially, I, I, first of all, I believe that when you're in office, you have an obligation to treat people of any religion and people of no religion equally. And that's a very important American principle that is not always, I think, being honored right now. Mm. Uh, But I also think it's fair game for those of us who are guided by faith to talk about it and to explain how it shapes our worldview. And right now, I'm also trying to remind people of faith that they have a choice because uh, uh, you would almost forget, uh, by the way, that some uh, self-styled religious uh, political officials talk, you'd almost forget about how much, at least in the Christian tradition that I'm part of, uh, is about uh, looking after the marginalized and identifying with the prisoner and welcoming the stranger and feeding the hungry. That This is the very stuff of salvation, at least on, on one reading of, of Christian faith. Yeah. And yet you would think all there was to it was uh, uh, a certain, um, certain view of the world that's being enforced by, uh, by some uh, uh, self-described religious leaders now. So you know, scripture, like the Constitution, admits of many interpretations, and people argue that's part of what it is, something people <laughs> argue over how to make sense of it. But for me, a lot of it has to do with recognizing what is bigger than you, recognizing what is bigger than your powers of understanding will ever touch. Um, that's why in the, in the uh, I'm, I'm Episcopalian in our liturgy, we talk about the peace that passes all understanding. Mm-hmm. It literally means there's things that go past understanding, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and having a certain amount of humility about that. If there's the biggest thing I get from faith is, is humility, which can also be very freeing in a sense because it means you don't have to be or resolve everything. Can you talk about one of your biggest failures? Mm. Um, well, I've had some election results that were pretty brutal. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a chapter in my book about the experience of running for state treasurer, an office nobody had heard of, and nobody had heard of me either. And I was running as a Democrat in Indiana in 2010, which is one of the worst years ever for Democrats. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely got my head handed to me. And yet, I think I learned more in that campaign than any campaign up until this one where I'm running for president. Um, and, uh, you know, it turned out the outcome of the campaign was less uh, important in my own development, at least, than uh, the experience of, of engaging with people who, some of whom were never going to agree with me and still trying to reach some level of understanding. And it served me well when I turned around and did go on to run for mayor, and uh, I think it served me well now. What, do you, what have you learned from this campaign? Hmm. Well, there's not a lot of time for reflection, so I think I'll be better able to answer that question Uh, when it's all run its course. But uh, I guess the biggest thing I've learned is that people are 
intimately affected by what happens in politics. Right now it's being talked about like it's just a show. Like yeah. just who called who what name and what was the tweet today and all this fighting on cable. And uh, through it all, people are finding that their lie, everything from the level of bullying going on in schools mm -hmm. to whether you can get a job with benefits is all tied up in, in our politics. Mm. All our politics is personal for somebody. And, uh, you know, I've always believed that kind of philosophically, but when you're on the trail and people are coming up to you at these rope lines saying, here's what's going on in my life. And here's what I'm hoping you will do as president or what I wish mm -hmm. you talked more about or what, um, I want candidates to speak to. You see just how, um, how central this is, uh, even if people don't maybe realize that politics is shaping their lives. And I think it's my job to, uh, learn about that and then, and then explain it and play it out for folks. Here's how your life is different because there's this president instead of that president or this law instead of that law and then make the case for why it would be better uh, when, when we do it our way. Yeah, that sounds uh, really mature. <laughs> no, I really appreciate um, following you in the media how, I mean, I haven't seen it if you have, where like I don't hear you bashing any of your opponents on either side and uh, I think that's really commendable. I, I try not to. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, about nostalgia because um, Ryan and I have written about this in the past and, and nostalgia is sort of this rose-colored rear view mirror. It's almost a two-dimensional view of a past that didn't really exist. Uh, regardless of what you think of, of Donald Trump, I, I, um, the, the, I actually like three-fourths of his, his slogan of make America great again. It's that again part mm. that, that actually, and if it were your slogan, I would be telling you the same thing, yeah. Mayor Pete, that, that the again thing acknowledges something that actually didn't I exist. So um, make America great sounds great to me. Yeah. Um, going back to, to this past where more people were oppressed and things weren't actually as beautiful as, as maybe we thought they were. Is that, is that a fair assessment of nostalgia? Yeah, you know, uh, Tony Jutt, the historian, uh, wrote a book about 10 years ago that anticipates a lot about the moment we're in right now. Um, but he tries to situate it in, in modern uh, kind of post-war history. And then he has this uh, line in there, something like he says, you know, the past is neither better nor, nor worse than now. It is just different. And mm -hmm. the past really is another country. There's no going there. And I think what we have to... The, I agree. I, I think there's no honest politics that can revolve around the word again. And uh, we're not going to find our greatness by retrieving it pickled out of some other moment. Mm. There are things that we have probably lost in the past that we might want to recover. And that's what the, that's the healthiest part of the conservative instinct. Mm. Um, but there's also a lot in the past that we do not want to go back to. Yeah. And so we need to view the past as a, as a book to be learned from, not a place we want to go. And if we learn from it the right way, then, then we find the things that were most noble or choice worthy about our past, uh, individually or collectively, and then talk about how to, how to kind of recover that in a new fashion that, that takes us to places we couldn't go otherwise. Nostalgia, look, I, I'm nostalgic about times that I know I was miserable at the time, but I feel nostalgic about them now. Sure, me too. Um, it's just the way our, our mind relates to the, to, I mean, way it's a good thing. It helps us put in perspective things we didn't appreciate at the time, but it mm -hmm. also is, is very risky. Um, and and it's why I think more than anything, we just got to think in terms of uh, of good and harm. Who was being harmed by the way things worked in the past? In the book, I've got a little meditation toward the end about what it would be like to walk one of the my predecessors as mayor through the streets of South Bend today. And I'm sure in, in some ways they'd be horrified to see the collapse of all these factories, these industries that they knew as a great places. These, these and at the same time, um, you know, they lived in a world where you died a lot younger. And if you were any kind of minority, it just sucked mm -hmm. uh, by today's standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we kind of washed that away in our, in our nostalgia for how things were. Uh, we're we living in one of those moments that I think people will be fascinated with and if we get it right maybe nostalgic about one day uh not right now i mean right now it's pretty bleak but i mean the choices we're about to make mm -hmm. are the stuff of history uh we are lucky and unlucky enough to be living in this moment that i think is going to shape at least the next 50 years yep. and what comes next could be really ugly or it could be really enlightened and my hope is that we wind up choosing to do the kinds of things that people will one day want to read about and write about and dream about as they're deciding how to get things even further yeah. All right, we got a bunch more to talk about, including we're going to have Mayor Pete read some Onion headlines. 
<laughs> about Mayor Pete. <laughs> We've got a bunch more questions as well, a lot more discussion coming up. And if you want to hear all that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode, but every week Ryan and I record an entirely different, much longer. It's always over an hour, long form Maximal episode over on the Minimalist's private podcast, which gives us the private space we need to talk about things we don't t- typically talk about in public. Plus, Patreon is the best way for us to fund this podcast and keep it 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. When you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast on Patreon, you'll also receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play right there on your favorite podcast app. You'll also get a link to um, our entire back catalog of more than 100 private podcast episodes. Heck, it's probably getting closer to 200 private podcast episodes now, it's Ryan. crazy. Time flies. Yes, indeed. So you can find all the details and all the good stuff, including an additional private podcast episode every week over at theminimalists.com slash support. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Being informed is more important than ever, especially in these times with the primaries coming up and then the presidential election coming up. I mean, don't just trust the headlines. I mean, it's okay to read a headline, but... Especially if they're onion headlines. <laughs> right. Definitely don't trust the onion headlines. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay to read headlines, but read <clears throat> read the rest of the article. Just do some research uh, before making you know these bold statements about these different candidates because you really don't know unless you, you dig into it. You know, I'd like to say something real quick, Ryan. I think it's probably, I tried to touch on this at the beginning, but you and I have, we have different political beliefs uh, and sometimes they align, they, they, they overlap or they sure. intersect. We like freedom. And th- we didn't have Mayor Pete on today to, to try to endorse him in any way. What we want to try to do is expose the world to someone like him who does have some good ideas and yeah. also has some ideas that we both disagree with. Sure. And it's okay to have a conversation with someone whom you disagree with on some topics. Well, dude, I mean, as, as divided, and I'm not trying to get all preachy here, man, but as divided as the country is right now, it's like we need to have conversations like that with all sides. Yeah. Uh, if we can't have conversations like that, then we just become further divided. And uh, that is, that's not good for anyone living in the, the United States of America. And we would definitely extend this invitation to other people, any other top tier candidates similar to Pete. So yeah. if Bernie wants to come on, yeah. if Elizabeth Warren wants to come on. <clears throat> Dude, if Trump wanted to come on, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation. I would sit down and have a conversation with Donald Trump for sure. <laughs> and and uh, I think we need to be willing to have these conversations with people that we agree with and we disagree with. Because here's what you'll find out. You can't disagree with someone about everything. Mm. Even we had a carnivore and a vegan on the podcast, we ended up talking about mostly the things they agree on. Mm. Even though their diets were completely different, even if your political diet is completely different from mine, I can still find some common ground and we can agree. Yeah. Hey, Josh, do you want to hear some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners? Let's do it. All right, here you go. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Josh. This is Lisa from Minnesota. My advice to your listeners who are moving and are wondering what to take and what to leave behind is... Imagine you are in your new home and you open a box and you, there is the thing that you are wondering about whether you want to take. And are you thinking, wow, I'm so glad to see this. I cannot wait to use this in my new home. Or are you thinking, oh man, what the heck was I thinking? Why did I pack this? What the heck am I going to do with this? So hopefully this will make things more clear to you listeners. Thanks. Hi, my name is Jamie Middleton, and I live in Orlando, Florida. I did have some ideas about um, things with kids. I recently, within the last couple of years, on my birthday and then at Christmas, I said, you know, I don't want things. I'd rather just do things with you guys. I'd rather have experiences. So we take a trip or we go someplace really fun or special. Um, Also, uh, instead of buying things for your kids, uh, we, like, have a membership to a science museum, a children's museum, um, and those are great things to ask for if people are looking for gifts for you as a family or for your kids. Get a zoo membership or ask for a museum membership because you can make that last all through the year. And those are places that your children can go and play with, quote, unquote, toys that are free, that belong to someone else, and they have to manage the clutter and you don't. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Mayor Pete for joining us today. If you want to check out his book, I'll hold it up for the YouTube audience here. It's called Shortest Way Home. It really is a beautifully written book, and it surprised me because I expected to get a couple chapters in just so I could learn a little bit about this guy who was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. But I ended up 
I was on vacation earlier this year and read the whole thing and mm. was it was engrossing and I could never say that about another political memoir and so you can check that out you can also visit him online peteforamerica.com and real quick for right right here right now here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists I teach a writing class speaking of beautiful writing if you want your writing to be as beautiful as Pete's uh, it's howtowritebetter.org. I've been teaching this writing class for about six years now. It's an online writing class. I've had students who are medical doctors, students who are high school students, and sort of everything in between. The commonality is people want to improve their writing, whether it's business emails, or you want to write your first book, or you want to start a blog, you want to learn how to write better tweets. The rising tide lifts all boats. And if you want to learn how to write better, then go to howtowritebetter.org. That's why my tweets are so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a question, <laughs> comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839, or send a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our emails over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails. For our added value this week, I wanted to go way back, Ryan. We're talking about one of the most taboo subjects on earth, politics. Yeah. But we wanted it to really be the original meaning of the word politics. You go back to the, 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 uh, the Greek root. It really just means the affairs of the city. And that's mm. why I thought, starting with Pete and having a conversation with him, because he's actually managed the affairs of a city. Yeah. And that's what politics means. Yeah. And, and so I think we got, we got into that conversation a bit today. But it is a taboo subject. So mm -hmm. here is one of the greatest songs from one of the greatest voices of any generation. Here's Sweetest Taboo from Sade. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.